This is our first lecture for Chapter 5 in Louis Vaughn's Doing Ethics. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at consequentialist moral theories. Now, the easiest way to think about uh, consequentialism uh, is just to think that an action is considered morally right if it produces the best possible consequences. Uh, that's what consequentialism means. It's a, an attempt to maximize the good. Uh, so when we think about consequentialist moral theories... Uh, we need to start off uh, just by acknowledging that this is probably the common sense way that most people think through moral situations. Uh, the idea that we want to produce the greatest balance of good over evil uh, just seems to make sense for most people. Uh, so when we were thinking about the trolley problem in our last lecture, uh, if you ask, it is, is it morally right to flip the switch to save five lives at the expense of one, Many people, when they first think about this problem, are thinking like a consequentialist. Uh, they think the consequences would be better if we save five lives at the expense of one. Uh, in other words, on balance, we're producing more good uh, than suffering. Um, and so this is usually the common sense way of thinking about uh, moral reasoning. Uh, but of course, we need to ask the question, uh, how do these theories actually work when they're tested against uh, our moral judgments and common moral experiences. And one of the ways that we test how these theories actually work is when we change the scenario. Um, this is one of the reasons why we uh, changed it up in the last lecture, where we're not just considering the trolley problem, uh, where we're flipping a switch, but we also consider what, what it would mean if we would have to push a large man off the bridge to stop the trolley, and most people, when we start thinking about that second situation, uh, change our uh, common sense approach to uh, consequentialist reasoning. And what we want to do in this lecture is uh, explore uh, that a little bit further by looking at two different uh, types of consequentialist theories. Uh, the first one that we're going to be looking at in this lecture is what's known as ethical egoism. And then in our next lecture, we're going to be looking at utilitarianism. Uh, so ethical egoism is the theory that uh, the right action is the one that promotes the most favorable balance of good over evil for oneself. Uh, so the consequences that we're concerned with in ethical egoism are the, con the con consequences that uh, result for, for me, for my benefit. And so uh, this is uh, self-interest. Uh, but it's not necessarily selfishness. Um, so when we think about ethical egoism, uh, self-interest is the right way to think about it, but not necessarily um, selfishness. Um, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, the theory is also not synonymous with self-indulgence or uh, recklessness, and hopefully we'll see why. Um, now, if we compare uh, ethical egoism versus uh, utilitarianism in terms of the trolley problem, uh, we can look at uh, a Bill and Ted here again quickly. Uh, so remember in the last lecture, uh, we have uh, Bill and Ted having different moral judgments, but in that scenario, I had them arguing for the same principle, so they were both utilitarianism, utilitarians in the last lecture, uh, but they had a different way of arguing out the utilitarian principle. Uh, here, what we see is that there are situations where people will disagree with one another, and their disagreements uh, result from having fundamentally different moral principles. So when it comes to the trolley problem, Ted might say that we should save five lives at the expense of one. And if you ask Ted why, uh, well, in this case, he's appealing to a utilitarian principle that we want to promote happiness for the most amount of people. And so this is Ted's argument. Uh, and Bill, on the other hand, says, no, we should save one life at the expense of the five. Now, what's different about this scenario, as opposed to what we talked about in our last lecture, is that the way that Bill argues here is as an ethical, ethical egoist. Uh, so he is arguing that we should promote uh, oneself uh, over... Uh, the collective, and Bill argues uh, this because he imagines himself being the one who uh, is tied to uh, the track by himself, and if he imagines himself, he put, if he puts himself in that scenario, uh, 
uh, he would want to make sure that he is protected. And so that is ethical egoism. Um, now, ethical egoism is not the same as doing just whatever one desires or whatever gives the most amount of pleasure. Um, there are more nuanced ways of thinking about ethical egoism than that. Uh, most of the time, ethical egoists are probably better off uh, by cooperating with others and avoiding actions that antagonize other people. And so this is one of the reasons why you won't just uh, always per pursue your desires in the moment, uh, because most ethical egoists will realize that it's in their own self-interest uh, to, uh, to cooperate with others. Now, there are two basic types of e ethical egoism. Uh, there's what's called act egoism. And in act egoism, the way that you determine a right action is that you must apply the egoist principle to every individual act. Now, many will argue that this form of uh, ethical egoism is actually quite impractical. Uh, because you have to think uh, through every action that you take um, as an egoist, and it's not necessarily practical uh, to work out your moral principle uh, this way. And so there's an alternative way of thinking about this principle, and that's rule egoism. Uh, now, in this scenario, the way that you determine a right action is that you must decide whether an act falls under a rule that, if it's consistently followed, would maximize your self-interest. And so when we think about rule egoism, uh, one of the easy ways to think about this is to think about uh, first setting up a society where you uh, set out clear rules for that society, uh, but the principle that you use to determine what rules you ought to have in that society would be the egoist principle. Um, and then once the rules are set, uh, then you live according to those rules, uh, but the thing that those rules are resting upon is the egoist uh, principle. Um, so that is the distinction between act egoism and rule egoism. Um, I should also note that uh, sometimes uh, there's a principle that's very much connected to ethical egoism called the libertarian principle. I mentioned this briefly in our last lecture. And uh, many libertarians find their philosophical justification for libertarianism in uh, some form of egoism. Now, this isn't true for all libertarians, uh, but there are many that uh, philosophically defend their libertarian principle using an egoist uh, a worldview uh, that we ought to promote self-interest. Uh, but when we look at the libertarian principle, this is a principle that says that we should promote individual rights uh, so it's not necessarily about just my self-interest when I'm a libertarian, but we want to promote everyone's individual rights so long as people do not use their rights to infringe upon uh, the, the free rights of other people. And as long as we uh, have those restrictions, uh, this makes up uh, a libertarian principle that can be rooted in an ethical egoism. And we'll talk about the libertarian principle here in just uh, a moment. Um, now, ethical egoism, some argue, uh, relies heavily on what's called psychological egoism. And this is just the notion that the ultimate motive for all people and for all actions is self-interest. Um, so it's one thing to say that uh, we, we ought to uh, construct rules and live a life that's based off of self-interest. Uh, but this is usually the argument that's given for that position. And the argument simply is that most people live off, out of self-interest anyway. And so if we construct an ethical principle that's based off of psychological egoism, then we can uh, construct moral rules that are consistent with human nature. And so this might be the way that you lay out the argument. Uh, so the argument for ethical egoism based upon psychological egoism is this. Uh, the first premise is we are not able to perform actions except out of self-interest. And so one of the questions that you might ask here, uh, this is just the principle of psychological egoism, but one of the questions that you might ask of this premise is, is that true? Uh, can you think of any action that you ever perform uh, where you're not actually acting out of self-interest? Um, are there any 
truly altruistic acts uh, where you're acting for the interests of someone else first. Um, and the ethical egoist will say, uh, no, all of our actions that we perform are actually out of, um, are actually out of self-interest. The second premise is we are not morally obligated to perform an action unless it's motivated by self-interest. And then the conclusion, therefore, we are morally obligated to do only what our self-interest motivates us to do. And so this is an argument for ethical egoism that's based upon psychological egoism. Now I want to spend a little time here talking about the libertarian principle. This doesn't necessarily come up in uh, your textbook, but again, ethical egoism is the philosophical uh, foundation for many libertarians, so I think it's worth at least uh, exploring this libertarian principle briefly. Um, the libertarian principle, again, is that we ought to, to promote uh, the free individual rights so long as people don't use those rights to infringe upon anyone else's uh, free rights. Now, there are three different ways that that principle can be articulated. The first way is what's called no paternalism. So these are laws protecting people from themselves. Uh, so a libertarian uh, oftentimes will say that they are opposed to, say, seatbelt laws, soda laws, drug laws, or most recently, there have been uh, many debates over uh, the wearing of masks. And so some libertarians will be opposed to uh, any mask laws that um, a city or a state tries to impose uh, because they'll say that this is infringing upon their free rights to take their own risks. And so uh, the idea of paternalism is uh, having a law that is protecting you from yourself. Libertarians will typically be against this. Uh, now, uh, the, soda, the soda ban is a great case study for thinking about the libertarian principle here. Uh, so, uh, several years ago, uh, the former mayor of New York, Michael Bloomberg, uh, put a soda ban in New York uh, where he was uh, restricting the sales of sodas uh, that were being sold in a 20-ounce container or more. And when Bloomberg was doing an interview about why he had the soda ban, uh, he said something that uh, would cause many libertarians to um, react with uh, some concern. Uh, so he said in this interview that we're not trying to take away anyone's rights with the soda ban. Instead, he said, what we're trying to do is to force you to understand that sugary drinks are unhealthy. Uh, now, again, a libertarian because they're against paternalism, would say we don't need the state to protect us against ourselves uh, when it comes to how much soda we should drink. And they specifically don't like the word force. So when Bloomberg says we're simply trying to force you to understand that sugary drinks are unhealthy, uh, well, that goes against what uh, libertarians uh, think is morally correct. Uh, we ought to be free to do whatever we want to do, uh, so long as we're not using our rights to infringe upon someone else. Well, later on in this uh, interview, Bloomberg said, and he was explaining why uh, this is actually a good law, he explained that New York City spends about $4 billion every year on health care for overweight residents. And sugary drinks are the most significant factor in the increasing number of obese or overweight New Yorkers. And so when a libertarian uh, considers some of the ways that Michael Bloomberg is reasoning in this situation, or the way that he was reasoning in this situation, uh, their concern is that if the government covers health insurance, uh, so many uh, libertarians would be opposed to government-run health insurance, uh, because if the government does provide that, then the government can coercively influence my diet. And so the default for most libertarians is to say that uh, we just don't want any laws protecting people from themselves. Uh, we don't want uh, soda bans. Uh, we don't want the government to be involved with our health insurance because the more that government is involved, the less rights that we have. 
Uh, so libertarians are opposed to paternalism. Um, libertarians are also opposed to moral legislation. Now, one of the reasons why libertarians are opposed to this is because they want to be free from the moral convictions of the majority culture. Uh, libertarians uh, very much recognize that people have uh, not only different moral values, uh, people have different religious values, people have different upbringings, and so they want to create a situation where uh, the most amount of, well, everyone, in fact, uh, has the freedom to live however they want to live so long as they don't infringe upon anyone else's rights. Uh, because, again, that's the libertarian principle. Now, there's an interesting case study that comes up when we think about this idea of no moral legislation. Uh, so, in 2015, in the state of Oregon, an administrative court made a decision to fine a business, a cake shop called Sweet Cakes by Melissa. They fined them $135,000 for discrimination. Now, this is a story where uh, a same-sex couple comes into this cake shop and they want Sweet Cakes to bake them a cake for their same-sex wedding. Uh, well, because of religious convictions, uh, Sweet Cakes by Melissa refused to bake the wedding cake and therefore they were fined by the state of Oregon uh, for $135,000 for discrimination because they violated a law of that state. Now, libertarians, when they look at a situation like this, uh, they would typically be opposed to uh, the decision to fine this couple. Uh, but at the same time, libertarians would also typically be for the same-sex couple. So they would want the same-sex couple uh, to be free to get married. So libertarians are usually for uh, institutions like same-sex marriage. Uh, and yet, uh, the same principle would say that you want to protect uh, a cake shop like Sweet Cakes by Melissa because they should also be free to practice uh, their uh, moral convictions as well. Uh, and so when it comes to the libertarian principle, uh, they want freedom for everyone so long as nobody uses their uh, freedom to infringe upon anyone else's rights. Uh, now, there is a question of whether or not uh, that principle is ever uh, really possible when it comes to no moral legislation, uh, because with this particular case study, uh, some people might uh, bring up the question, well, uh, can't I be free to live in a, a state where I'm not discriminated against? Um, and so this really uh, puts some tension on the libertarian principle uh, as a regarding whether such a situation is even possible. Uh, the third area that libertarians are usually opposed to is the idea of the redistribution of income or wealth. Uh, so they are opposed to taxes, um, or at least they want minimum taxes. And so if you think about uh, a case study with, say, uh, Bill Gates. So when I first started following Bill Gates and using this as an illustration of uh, the libertarian principle when it comes to redistribution of wealth. Um, when I first started talking about this uh, in 2012, Bill Gates was worth uh, just over $40 billion. And last time I checked, um, it's probably more than that now, uh, Bill Gates is worth over $85 billion, uh, which means that since he started Microsoft, uh, he has literally made over $150 every second since he uh, started Microsoft um, so many years ago, uh, which is one of the reasons why people say that it's literally not worth Bill Gates' time to pick up a random $100 bill, uh, because in the second that it, that it took him to pick up that $100 bill, uh, he made more uh, just from the amount that his wealth uh, generates. So many people will look at a situation like Gates and say, surely in this type of situation, it would be just to redistribute Gates's wealth. Well, from a libertarian perspective, uh, since our fundamental right is the right to liberty, they would say that we should never use any individual, uh, no matter how just the cause, as a tool for the betterment of society. Uh, because, again, the fundamental right is the right to liberty. Uh, so, again, this is the libertarian principle, uh, which uh, many will say is based upon 
uh, ethical egoism. Now we can take a few moments to evaluate whether or not ethical egoism is a good principle um, to uh, promote. And we're going to do this again by looking at the criteria that we mentioned in our last lecture. Uh, so the first criterion is just consistency with our considered moral judgments. Now one of the major criticisms that ethical egoists face is that many people will say that it's not actually consistent with many of our uh, considered moral judgments. Um, so here's another case study uh, where you see firemen uh, who are looking at a house and they're watching this house burn. So this is an actual case study in Tennessee where a Tennessee family's house burns to the ground as firefighters stand and watch. And the reason why the firefighters stand and watch is because they have a, a what's sometimes called a pay-to-spray uh, policy in their community. Uh, so the fire department is not a, a city uh, fire department or a volunteer fire department that many communities have. Instead, it's sort of like insurance or sort of like a membership that you buy in this particular city. So for $75 a month, uh, you can pay your dues uh, so that if your house ever catches on fire, uh, the fire department will come and they'll put it out. Uh, and if you don't pay the fee, the $75 um, a month to pay for the firefighters, uh, well, that is a risk that you, you are taking. Um, many have compared this to the whole idea of car insurance. Uh, so when it comes to car insurance, uh, some people will say that uh, talking about this firefighter situation, that you can't get into a car accident and then buy car, car insurance to pay for your accident. Uh, in the same way, they're arguing that you can't uh, forego fire insurance uh, or paying your dues to the firefighters and then expect that the firefighters will come and put out the fire. And so if you do that, it removes all incentives for the firefighters to do their job. Uh, and so this is a community that had a membership due. And this house that you see here was a house where uh, the family didn't pay the $75 a month. And so when their house got on fire, uh, the, the fire department showed up. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the fire didn't spread to anyone else's house, uh, people who did pay their dues. Um, and when they made sure that nobody was uh, within any danger, they stood there and they watched the house burn down. Now, many people, when they look at a situation like this, uh, they just instinctively feel that, that that's not right for the fire department to do. Uh, but someone could say, uh, this is consistent with the ethical egoist uh, position. Um, it's consistent, perhaps, with the libertarian principle uh, because what you want to do is you want to act out of self-interest and if people are not going to act out of self-interest when it comes to buying their own uh, fire insurance, uh, then it's in the self-interest of the fire department uh, to let the house burn. Otherwise, there's no incentive to pay the dues. Uh, and so uh, one of the things you have to wrestle through is whether or not there's a tension there. Um, and if that tension causes you to give up on the ethical egoist position. Um, and so there are many actions... That, that we might consider uh, wrong ethically, but ethical egoism might endorse. The second criterion is just consistency with our uh, moral experiences. And here the major critique is that when we, when we think about what ethical egoism entails, uh, it seems to violate, violate our notion of moral impartiality. Uh, that is, in treating people as equals. Uh, so you could ask the question, uh, what would your attitude be towards a friend who ordered her life according to her own ethical egoism? Uh, would you trust that friend? Uh, wouldn't you want to make sure that that friend treated you as an equal? Uh, or if you think about uh, this house burning down, um, maybe you could say that we want everyone to treat uh, themselves like the fire department just to act out of their own self-interest. Uh, but what if you were the person who had your house burning? Um, isn't there 
some principle of equality that we want to to live out here. If if it was you, would you want your house to burn down? Uh, so is is that really the principle that we want to promote? Um, well, this criterion would say that it seems to go against some of our uh, ethical experiences uh, when it comes to fairness and treating people impartially, um, and we don't want to always just put our own interests uh, first and foremost. Uh, and so that's the second criterion that is worth considering. And then the third one is whether or not this uh, principle is youth useful in practice. And so you have to think about whether or not uh, there are situations where this just isn't practical, isn't useful. Um, and if the principle isn't useful, uh, then people will say that that is a reason for rejecting it. Uh, so that is our lecture on ethical egoism. In lecture two, uh, we will continue uh, looking at consequentialist theories, and specifically we'll be looking at the utilitarian principle.